joints are points of contact. Either they are located between bone and bone or between cartilage and bone, costal cartilages and ribs, for example, or between tooth and bone. They are points of contact. It is not necessary that you might think that the joint should be movable. No, not all the joints in the body are movable. But there are certain types of joints that are movable joints. And this depends on the type of connective tissue that is located between the articulating structures. Sometimes we have collagen fibers between the articulating structures, like for example, here between the flat bones of the skull, there is a very short collagen, thick collagen fibers. So you expect that this joint is immovable joint. There's no movement taking place between the bones of the skull. But it's yet it's a joint. Again, I repeat, a joint is a union, an articulation, not necessarily movable. The second type is that there is a fibrocartilage in between the articulating bones, for example, here. And this is called cartilaginous joint. So there is cartilage, not always fibrocartilage, but there is cartilage. So it is called cartilaginous joint. Again, these joints, most of them are slightly mobile. There is a slight mobility. For example, like the joints between the, vert the vertebrae in the vertebral column, the intervertebral disc, there is a slight mobility. And then the third type of joint, when there is a space, there's a fluid, synovial fluid, synovial membrane, and these are the highly mobile joints. So whenever we need a, mo a mobile joint, the structure will be in the form of a synovial joint. Let's start with the first type of joint, the fibrous joint. They lack a cavity, there is no cavity. The bones are held together, as I mentioned, by connective tissue. There is little or no movement. So for example, on the suture between the bones of the skull, there is no movement. But in the other joints, for example here, which are called syndesmosis, between the radius and ulna, between the bones of the leg, tibia and fibula, there is a longer fibrous tissue called interosseous membrane. And this allows a little degree of movement between the bones. So this is a syndesmosis. Please do not mix this joint with the joints that are present here or here. These are the superior and inferior radioulnar joints or proximal and distal radioulnar joints. And they are synovial joints and they allow pronation and supination. So there is a wider range of mobility taking place. And the third one is the gomphosis, we call it. It is the joint of the tooth between the tooth and its socket, the bony socket, which is present in a process either in the mandible or in the maxilla. And the process is called the alveolar process. And this is the socket. The tooth is connected to the bone by a ligament, fibrous tissue, which is called peri around odontal ligament. It is, again, it is immobile, or there is a very minor degree, a microscopic degree of mobility. This is important to give us an indication about the degree of pressure when uh, we bite. And also, if you have something stuck in between your teeth, you will feel that because there is a minor degree of mobility, microscopic amount. But if there is mobility, then this is a pathological condition. So we studied the first type of joints, which are called fibrous joints. Now the cartilaginous joint. So there is cartilage, either like, for example, here, direct articulation between cartilage and bone, and this is called synchondrosis. Or the other type is in the epiphyseal plate between the epiphysis and the metaphysis. These are cartilages that lay down bony tissue. And then at certain age, usually after 21 years of age, they will stop doing that, they will calcify, and what we say that they are, cl they close. So this is again another union between bone and cartilage, and it is called epiphyseal cartilage plate, and the third type is the symphysis. We have many symphyses. One of them is the symphysis pubis between the two pubic bones, and in the symphysis, there is a fibrocartilage in between the two bones. A fibre, this is the strongest type of cartilage. Remember, there is a hyaline cartilage, there is a fibrocartilage, and an elastic cartilage. This is the strongest type of cartilage, the fibrocartilage. It is present as a sandwich between the two bones, either in the symphysis pubis, usually they are present in the midline, like the symphysis pubis, like the manubrio sternal joint here, 
the, uh, the angle of Lewis and all the joints between the bodies of the vertebrae, the intervertebral discs. They are all symphyses and they are slightly movable. The third type of joint which produces movement is the synovial joint. And there's a cavity here. This is one of the feature. And the second is that the two bones, the two articulating bones, they are covered by this bluish structure, which is a cartilage called articular cartilage. And usually this articular cartilage is highly, usually, not always, but usually it's a highly cartilage to reduce friction and absorb the shock. And then there is a capsule. This is the capsule, see? So there is a, a fibrous tissue capsule here. And of course, there is a space. So that's the capsule, which has an outer fibrous layer. And sometimes it is much thickened to form a ligament. And then the capsule is lined with the red structure, which is a synovial membrane that produces a fluid called synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is a viscous fluid. It is clear, transparent, sometimes a little bit yellowish. And in appearance and consistency, it looks like the white of an uncooked egg. So that's why it's called synovial, over from egg, synovial fluid. So this fluid has many functions. It bathes this, all these surfaces. It fills the cavity of the joint and is secreted by the red structure, which is the lining of the capsule. This fluid, apart from reducing friction, acting as shock absorber, remember that it carries nutrients and oxygen to this cartilage because the cartilage is avascular. So it needs this fluid for nourishment and at the same time, remove the byproducts of metabolism. If there's any uh, debris which results from the wear and tear of the use of the joint, then there are macrophages as well uh, present in this synovial fluid which will eat or remove these debris. So this fluid is very important. In fact, as I said, that it carries oxygen and removes CO2. So it has some gas dissolved in it. And whenever you reduce the pressure inside some of the joints, especially the, the joints of the, of the knuckles, you will feel that the, these uh, gas bubbles, they pop up. It's like uh, when you open a bottle of uh, fizzy drink, then you, you reduce the pressure then the gas will come up. So that's why you hear the sound. It's not a friction between the bones. It's the pop up of these gas bubbles. That's why when you do it once or twice, then you cannot do it again. You have to wait, let's say, for half an hour until more gas is dissolved in, and then it can pop up again. This video is a very short video, but very nice. It's, it will deal with the synovial fluid function and why do your knuckles pop. The other features of the synovial joints is that they have ligaments, accessory ligaments. These ligaments could be extra capsular outside the capsule. So, and they are thickening of the capsule. Remember, as I said that here, the capsule can be thickened. So it form a ligament. Remember a ligament is it's a dense, regular connective tissue. So let's take uh, the knee joint as an example here. We have, uh, this is the lateral bone. So we have a lateral collateral ligament here or it's called fibular collateral ligament because it's attached to the fibula. On the other side, we have the medial collateral ligament or they call it the tibial collateral ligament. Collateral means that it's on the side because this joint is a hinge joint, flexion and extension. So the ligaments, the thickenings are on the sides of the joint. So these are located in the capsule of the joint. But in addition to that, you can see that when you remove the capsule, there are other ligaments connecting between the tibia and the femur inside the joint. And these ligaments are the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. They are called cruciate ligaments because they form a cross. Not all the joints have ligaments inside them, but most of the synovial joints, they have extra capsular ligaments. Another feature of synovial joints is that they might have what we call an intraarticular disc or menisci. So this is an example of a joint having intraarticular disc. This is the temporomandibular joint. There is a mandibular fossa in the temporal bone, and this is the mandible, which articulates here forming the TMJ, the temporomandibular joint. The joint is divided into two compartments by a fibrocartilage, an intraarticular disc. Looks like a cap if you look at it from the side. Another example here is the, in the knee joint, 
there is again there is fibrocartilage like this one which is called meniscus lateral and medial meniscus these menisci they have the shape of like a c shape so they are like this if you look at them from above this is we are looking at them from the from the front but if you look at them from above so they are something like that they have horns here and they are very important in, for stabilizing the joint and for changing the articular surface, making or modifying the articular surface. Because here, the distal end of the femur has a changing curvature. So during movement, these menisci, they open and close in order to make the two bones fit to each other. And while they are moving, while they are moving, they are making ripples where in the synovial fluid and help spreading the synovial fluid. So they have a lot of functions. They act as shock absorbers. They make the articular surfaces fit to each other. They move the synovial fluid. But the problem is that these horns, they might be torn when the joint is, is hurt. They call them cartilages for the, like for the knee joints. When there's a knee joint injury, it might involve the ligaments and might involve the cartilages. Not the articular cartilages. The articular cartilages are present here. These are hyaline cartilages. But I'm talking about the menisci, the intraarticular fibrocartilage. Then we have another term which is related to a joint, which is called bursa. Bursa is like a pillow that is filled with synovial fluid. So it's a pillow of synovial sheath filled with fluid. Usually it is located whenever there is friction between tendon and bone, bone and skin to reduce the friction. And some of these bursi, uh, they communicate with the cavity of the joint. Like for example here, if you look at the knee joint, this is a, a longitudinal section in the knee joint. Look at the distal end of the femur. Look at the changing curvature. And these are the menisci. This is one of them, but it has, because it has two horns, so when it is cut, you can see the horns. And there's the cavity. The cavity communicates with a pad of synovial fluid, which is located here. Suprapatellar bursa, above the patella. This is the patella, and this is the suprapatellar bursa. It reduces the friction between the tendon of quadriceps femoris and the femur. So this is an example of a bursa that communicates with the cavity of the joint. The same joint has another bursa between the patella and the skin to reduce friction between patella and skin. So it's called prepatellar bursa. And this bursa does not communicate with the knee joint. You can see here that this bursa gets inflamed because of excessive friction as it happens in this position. And inflammation of this bursa will give a clinical condition which is called housemaid's knee because this is the, the way that this bursa gets inflamed and is exposed to a lot of friction. Another example of a bursa that is, reduces friction between skin and bone is the bursa which is located behind the elbow, between the skin of the elbow and the olecranon process of the ulna. And this gets inflamed mostly in students because of the friction. That's why inflammation of this bursa gives rise to a clinical condition called student's elbow. It, is, it does not communicate with the cavity of, of the elbow joint. So it, uh, the inflammation is not transmitted to inflammation of the elbow. It's only in the bursa. The knee joint is one of the joints uh, that is subjected to a lot of body weight. And so wear and tear degenerative changes take place. A cartilage is not sensitive. So this results in destruction of the bone. And the bone is sensitive. And then the patient can feel that. These are the most commonly joints affected by osteoarthritis or osteoarthrosis because of the wear and tear, the hip joint and the knee joint. And because the cartilage is not easily repaired because it has no blood supply, as I mentioned before, so usually the treatment is the replacement, arthroplasty. So you can see here that there is hip arthroplasty, usually a ceramic or a metal prosthesis, as well as you can see here, in the knee joint, again, there is arthroplasty of the knee joint. In arthroscopy, they pass a scope inside the joint, as you can see it here, and they can remove the torn meniscus or the, the torn part of the meniscus. Otherwise, this torn part 
will like lock the joints at sometimes or make the joint unstable because it's floating in fluid. And so they remove the torn meniscus if it, the problem is with the meniscus. But if the problem is with the ligament, especially a cruciate ligament, the anterior cruciate ligament, then it should be surgically treated.